excited to work with. I don't know if the guy who I promised uh, that I would wait for is back, uh, but it doesn't matter because I've waited for him anyway. Okay, so we're going to talk about layer two today. Uh, and we're going to talk about particularly something which we've been calling the optical virtual machine. Now, when most people think of a virtual machine, they think of stacks and registers and all these other things. And I'm not a uh, incredibly uh, advanced computer scientist, so I think I can make an argument that this thing's a virtual machine, but usually when I say OVM, people think of something else. So actually, what we're going to be talking about today is one particular subset called optimistic game semantics. Uh, and basically the idea is, um, what's going on with this layer two, and how can we try to bring it under a sort of more unified umbrella? What's up, guys? A more unified umbrella. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? First thing we're going to do is we're going to spend some time dissecting what layer two is today, and sort of looking at uh, how it functions, and what it accomplishes. The next thing that we're going to do is we are going to take uh, all of the components that we use in trying to describe layer two, and talk about how we should try to use those to build the layer two. Okay, and then the last thing here, which I don't know if this is really an agenda point, but it's something that I want, is I do not want to finish these slides, okay? So the reason that this is like not a video that is up on our website or being posted on our Twitter is because of us, you guys. <laughs> so what this means is that th there's no point in us having this here unless people ask questions and engage, okay? So before I go forward, I'm not gonna say my word until someone asks a question. Do you feel like you're a bit too optimistic about um, like audience participation? <laughs> <laughs> you look at the presentation. I don't have a, too optimistic is an oxymoron. Okay, that's what I say. Okay, great. Okay. All right, let's so let's motivate this a little bit. So we got layer two. Layer two is popping. We could even say it's a Cambrian explosion. Okay, it started with this guy Spillman, I think, don't call me on that, I'm not really a Bitcoiner. Uh, did very, very simple payment channels on Bitcoin. Then we had the Lightning Network come out in 2015. Then we started seeing more different state channels, designs, sprites, virtual channels, generalized channels, right? We started getting things like TrueBit, and I uh, come from a background of Plasma, and Plasma is perhaps uh, the most exciting but also guilty of creating huge amounts of diverse designs and um, varying implementations. This is a like small selection of the quote, plasma flavors that we have in the plasma design world. Um, and even more so, we've got m other incredible things happening. We've got rollups, the, the optimistic flavor, the ZK flavor. NOCAS is a commit chain, which is basically plasma, but they didn't want to call themselves plasma because they're not plasma. Uh, Arbitron, who was in the room, woo! It's like another better version of TrueBit, right? There's lots and lots of these L2s coming about, right? Um, so this is wonderful. As a researcher, this is very exciting. As a user who wants to be doing different things in Layer 2, this is very exciting. Um, but it's not like all these ideas are totally unique, right? At the end of the day, most of them are revolve around one thing, and that is this notion of disputes, right? Usually something happens on the off-main chain, and then someone claims something happened on the main chain, and then someone else disputes them about it, right? This is sort of the basis, base things that happens. And what we see in a lot of uh, papers is that we completely reinvent this wheel, right? So every these are two, you know, layer two protocol n and layer two protocol n plus one. This is like often sort of you know what we get. And I, I don't, I mean this in jest, of course. You know, citations are very important, and everyone's standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, but everything uses disputes. This is the point. Okay. Another thing that we're realizing is that uh, the, the sort of meme of one L2 to rule them all, other than out, outside maybe the Bitcoin world, because unfortunately only lightning is really possible on Bitcoin, this is a lie. This is just a blatant lie, okay? What we see is that different layer two designs are built for different applications, they're built for different use cases. So what we need to say, see is not one L2 to rule them all, but like, you know, some L2s shaking hands and interoperating, because in reality, Users are going to want to use many such applications that Layer 2 can provide, and it's not going to be just one that gives it to them. That's not to say that we're going to have, you know, thousands perhaps, but it would probably have more than one. Okay, so why well, haven't we got any questions yet? So I'm just going to pause awkwardly again for questions. Does everyone agree with this? Any hot takes? Is anyone going to prove me wrong? There's only one L2 to rule them all? Perhaps there have been L2 dev? No? Okay, good. That's what I'd like to hear. <laughs> so let's try to understand a bit about what Layer 2 really is, okay? So like at a high level, I think there's like four pretty distinct things that go into layer two, okay? Four steps, if you were. So the one thing that you do is you check the blockchain state. We're at, we're at DevCon, so I'll say Ethereum. 
check the blockchain state, see what's going on right now, right? The next thing that you do, and this is the sort of layer part, the second layer, is you get some local information and you look at it and you observe it, right? The third thing that you do is you make some kind of an assumption, right? So this is usually of the form, I will dispute things, um, and we'll be talking about that a lot here, but there's lots of different assumptions you can make. Um, and then the last thing you do is you make some prediction about future L2 state. So when I have you know, two coins in a channel, what this means is I believe in the future, I will be able to withdraw all two coins from the channel. It's not uh, really anything other than that, okay? And so like an example of this are state channels. I, I see on chain there are five ETH in a channel, which is usually just implementable by multi-sig. I see that I've only si signed some certain state, usually the one with the highest nonce, right, in your sort of traditional Ethereum style payment channel. I make the assumption that if someone tries to withdraw from an older state, I'm going to go ahead and bring that state forward and dispute it. And based on that, that those three things, I can make an assumption based on that, the fourth thing, that I will be able to withdraw according to the state S. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Questions, comments, concerns? Okay, I'm going to need questions at some point, so you guys better buckle up. Okay, great. So we have some fun, uh, you know, some fun formalizations that we can make around this, uh, which are very reminiscent of like things in CBC future. So here's the Ethereum blockchain, right? So here, like, the, you know, here's sort of the head state of Ethereum, and based on the head state, there's some subset of the next blocks that can appear, right? These are here, and based on the details of the EVM, you know, maybe you can't unburn money, for example, if you've sent it to the zero address, it can't come back, uh, but it can be sent to the zero address if it has been already. So here's some money being burned, and now we know that these states are no longer possible because this is the one that just got mined, right? And so the EVM, via the you know, consensus algorithm that we call Ethereum itself and Ether, is progressing through this futurist cone of Ethereum, right? Which is like sort of borrowed from physics, um, you know, for all but the meme, it's not like any of the math goes into it. Um, and it, th this is what we're doing, right? So this is one thing that happens. What's the other thing that happens? The other thing that happens is we have this local information, right? Alice and Bob are passing things around, signatures, inclusion proofs, we've got local information. TM, it's off chain, right? Okay, the last thing that we do is we make some assumptions, right? So the EVM set says that some set of future states are possible, right? It's a pretty large set. And what I do as someone who's trying to make a prediction about future L2 state is I make an additional assumption that is not inherent to the EVM. Okay, so here we imagine sort of two forks of the blockchain, right? So, so imagine that we're at a state right here and someone maliciously tries to withdraw some money, okay? I will assume, if I have a channel balance, and I'm trusting that I have a channel balance, that at some point in the future, this thing will get disputed, right? So what that means is basically what I'm doing is I'm looking at any such chain where no disputes have occurred, and I say, I don't believe that this is going to happen. It's an assumption. It's an additional quality of the state. Um, and it's an assumption that you make about the state, right? So if we combine those two things, we get something like this, right? We have the finalized blocks that we saw before, Right? We, have, we have the same Ethereum futures code as before. But now, based on this layer, right, some of these states which are possible according to EVM are no longer possible according to my assumptions because I believe that I'm going to do something about them. That's usually the assumption. Right? Uh, and this is what we see. And furthermore, one of the things that gives us the great scalability uh, in Ethereum is that these, this cone does not just restrict um, as new blocks come out, it actually restricts as messages are passed around. So if I get a new message and it tells me I can do a new dispute, this narrows in the cone of future states that I'm assuming are possible. So we can call this our optimistic futures. Okay, with me so far? Yes, nods, excellent. <laughs> Questions? Okay, I got a oh, question, yes. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> there you go. Um, why can we assume that it's going to be, I mean, this assumption is clear in, in its content, but why can we assume that someone doesn't have an outside motivation not to resolve the uh, correct state? Ah, so that's a great question. And so, you know, extra protocol incentives are talked a lot about even in layer one and certainly in layer two. Um, and they're an active area of research, and we need to continue researching these things. Uh, in general, however, we, uh, we believe this because we think that blockchains are meant to be censorship resistant. So usually in layer two, we use the properties that we're assuming that L1 fulfills to make our assumptions sound reasonable. So in a proof of work world, right, we have this decentralized network where anyone can start you know, burning some electricity to mine a block. And because anyone in the world is gonna do that, I have my fingers crossed that in the next, you know, whatever the dispute period is where the blocks are, at least one of those people are going to be willing to accept my transaction. Now that's not to be said that there aren't like important nuances to be analyzed here. So one, one, one like critical example of this that we have to be careful about is what if the dispute 
to keep my money safe costs me more money than the dispute itself, uh, it costs me more money than the dispute is going to get me, right? So that happens, we're in trouble. So we want to be careful and, and design our protocols carefully so that the, the assumptions that we make are as reasonable as possible. Can I ask another question? You, that was one. You right, may so ask the third. At the one that I just saw. Yeah, it'll be back. Um, it looks like it's not infinite anymore, but it is still infinite. Oh, right? what, a, what a segue. What a segue. Is this the best we can do? You're totally right. So unfortunately, we can't just write a computer program that does a for loop over all the future Ethereum states that are possible and checks whether they analyze your assumptions. This is computationally infeasible, right? So this is a great tool for what we've described so far. is a great framework, a great model for describing how layer two protocols that exist work. But you're right that it's not really useful in constructing some sort of layer two client that is like unified or magically combined everything in one way, because this is a very, very large set, in fact, infinite. Now maybe with the gas limit and like the fact that there's only so many bytes, it's like actually kind of finite, but there's like way more atoms, you know, way more than atoms in the universe worth of these things, right? Yeah, so exactly right. So what we've been doing here is we've been looking at layer two, right? This framework that we just talked about is a way that you look at layer two systems. It is not, however, very as useful in building uh, layer two systems, right? But somehow this is what we really want to do, right? At the end of the day, research should be motivated, motivated by actionable things. And what we really want is to be able to build the layer two protocols in some framework that extends beyond uh, you know, a, a particular plasma researcher who has intuitions for what plasma does and a particular channels researcher has intuitions for what channels do, and so on and so forth. We want to try to unify this under one sort of shared framework. Right? So we want, like, what I like to think of as dispute Legos, right? We want some way to contextualize, and instead of replacing, so like in Plasma, for example, we're very, very guilty of this. We have, like, uh, limbo swaps and limbo exits and, you know, challenges and all these things. And these are very, very useful for us as Plasma researchers to uh, be able to talk to each other but they're not good when we want to bring someone new on board because we have to teach them all of this stuff, right? And what you know, the people who we want to be talking to uh, uh, do understand is like logic and math and models, right? And so we want to be able to push that. And so that's going to be sort of the goal of what we're going to do here today. Great question, great question. So we want to be able to build things because the space is just too large. It's basically infinite, you know, for all intents and purposes. Right? This is too big to compute. Here we go. I wish you'd asked it one slide later, or I would have been able to switch immediately, or I just put this slide earlier. But you're exactly right, right? So we want something that is easier to compute, um, but we also want something that is flexible enough to build a protocol, right? So for example, there's a layer two protocol that says um, I can burn all of my money whenever I want, and of course once it's burnt, you're never gonna go back from it being unburnt. But this is a very useful protocol, right? So we want somewhere in the middle between the spectrum of just like for looping over all Ethereum blocks, this can't be done without you know, a magically infinite computer, and something that's actually useful. So that's what we're gonna to try to pull out here today. Okay, other questions? Other questions? All right, good, okay, well, I'll push on for now. So, let's talk about uh, some hints, okay? I, I pulled these from a couple of different layer two um, sort of designs and protocols. Um, so in the upper right here, uh, Upper right here, we have uh, some local information. This is from a great paper called No Cost. It's a commit chain, it's very similar to Plasma. So they, lo, lo and behold, have this notion of local information, right? It's the same thing that we were talking about before, a few slides back, uh, what we called iLocal. They're using that in their paper. Hmm. Okay, now there's another, uh, there's another hint that, that I'd like to share here, which is from the Generalized State Channels paper. So great, great work by the counterfactual team, which is now being unified across almost all state channels for Ethereum. Um, this is very exciting. There's a for all here, okay? I, I like for alls, and you'll see I me mean, talk about for alls a lot for the rest of these slides. So there's another hint, for all. Um, so here's one from uh, a coworker of mine. Challenges, so this is from a Plasma paper, and there's a no set of challenges, right? It seems like disputes are primarily based on challenges. One person says one thing, another challenges it with another. And in more advanced protocols, we even have several layers of challenges, where maybe one guy says one thing, another guy challenges, and then the, the guy responds, the first guy responds again, okay? So here are some sort of, these, these are what I think are hints that will sort of lead us to being able to construct something very useful. Okay, that makes sense, questions there. Okay, everyone has a talk slide in their talk, so I'll have mine here. Um, one of, the word that I love from this tweet, which I'll, I, okay, I guess I'll read it, not to insult you all. The value of blockchain notarization is not proof of existence, it's proof of inexistence. The ability to prove the message chat is the one and only one of a certain type that has been signed, or the message of some type has not been published yet. 
So this is very often a property that we see in our L2 protocols. Someone makes a challenge, and there is a possible response that can be made, but after some time out, that response isn't made. And we take that as to say, well, this must mean the response doesn't exist, okay? And so existence, particularly, is the word here I want to pull out. So we've seen some challenges, we've seen some for-alls, and we've seen existence. And it turns out that there is something uh, that has a lot of those same words, okay? So it's known as first order logic, right? This is your ands, your ors, your nots. This is your for-alls and your exists. So what we're gonna go through in the rest of this is we're going to look at this within the context of layer two, right? Um, so we looked at this for a while and it, uh, it was very interesting to us as researchers that there were sort of analogies here and we came up, we tried to come up with some designs for how this could be sort of integrated into L2 for pra in practice. It took, us to, oh, for, it took us a while to hit one that we thought was pretty solid. Um, but a big, big key moment that helped us understand this was we found something called dialogical logic, okay? Um, this is related to a broader field called game semantics, and I started this talk by saying game semantics, right? Um, so dialogical logic is an interpretation of these first order logic uh, sort of expressions and evaluating whether they're truths or false by interpreting each expression as a game. And it interprets truth of this expression as the existence of a winning or losing strategy for the equivalent game, okay? So this is very interesting. And just for context, so semantics, it took me a long time to figure out what semantics meant because I'm not really, uh, you know, I, I've never taken a semantics course or anything. So semantics is like meaning, right? So first order logic, like there's actually lots of logics which are sort of satisfied by the language that uses for all and exists, right? So these are very important, by the way. So remember, the upside down A is like for all. I don't know why you put it upside down, but you do. The backwards E is exists. I guess we're just like inverting letters um, in, 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 in the logic. They mean A and E. What's that? Otherwise, they mean A and E. Otherwise, they mean A and E. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's a, you know, that sounds very tautologically true, I suppose. Okay. Um, so, so it's worth understanding that there are different semantics, okay, for, for, for the same sort of language of first order logic. Okay, so a simple example of this is like classical logic is the one that you learn in logic 101. It's what everyone's familiar with, and this is this you know where you can prove something like true or false, right? There's also something called intuitionistic logic, which it turns out does not. It was like philosophers arguing about logic and saying we don't like this thing called the law of excluded middle. So in classical logic, for any proposition p, you can say p or not p, right? You can, and then that's decided to be true. Sounds reasonable, right? Sounds either true or it's false. But apparently these philosopher guys were like, well, I don't know if everything's true or false, like maybe something's not, right? And so intuitionistic logic is like a version of logic which removes the ability to say true or, or P or not P, okay? Um, so these are semantics. Depending on how you interpret what the language uh, means, th these are called semantics. And so we want one of these for layer two. So we're gonna call it optimistic game semantics because basically the way that layer two scales is you, have, you use an optimistic property. You assume that everyone's gonna play along, and so the blockchain has to process less information than the total computation that went into the state machine uh, that was running off chain, okay? That was making these optimistic decisions. Okay, so that was a lot. So I hope that we have some questions at this point in time. Come on, someone hand me a full room here, full room. Do you have a concrete example? Absolutely, okay, a concrete example of what? Um, how does it relate to L2? Ah, so that's going to be the rest of the presentation. <laughs> let, me, let me give you, me give you uh, 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 a simple example, okay? So in, in logic, we'll, we'll hit on this later, but in logic there are these things called atomic predicates, okay? So it's very simple atomic predicates, like equals, right? right? Like, you know, one equals two is either true or false. I think it's false. Yes? Uh, and so on and so forth. So here, here's, here's another example of an atomic predicate, okay? Verify signature, okay? This is another example of a common predicate, okay? So in state channels, what is a state channel? Well, you can build a state channel out of multi-state, and thankfully Bitcoin has multi-state, and so this is why Bitcoin can do channels. Um, so here, here's an example, an intuition for how, how we're gonna do this. There's a, you can write a function called verify multi-state, right? There's an atomic predicate that verifies a multi-state. So let's say there's like some participants, right? I'm gonna call these PTPS, because I'm lazy at writing, okay? So let's say there's like five participants, right? We can write a verify, right, multi-sig, right? Which takes in the participants, right, sigs, right, and the message being signed, right? Okay, so this is another example of an atomic predicate, right? A thing that evaluates true or false. Wouldn't it be nice if instead of having to redefine this thing, 
we could say for all p in participants, verify sig. Ooh. Ooh. Ah. Right? Okay, so maybe, maybe hopefully that's an instructive example. So the idea that we're trying to do here is we're trying to pull out these sort of very, very, like, very large sort of monstrosity uh, Frankenstein layer 2 solutions where we have to write a bunch of custom things like this and try to like condense them down into a composition of these logical statements. Okay, so we want to say for all the P in participants, verify the sig of that individual P. And so this allows you to not write a verify sig and a verify multi sig, you just write a verify sig. So maybe hopefully that's a helpful example. Good. Yeah. Great. Other questions? So uh, when you said that the, the logic you're talking about is uh, a, strategy, a winning strategy and a losing strategy for a game, what does that mean? Like, ah, okay. So I, I'll get into that. And so um, maybe I'll just try to provide intuition now because I'll have an actual like, game tree example soon. Um, but what that means is we take the logical expression and we convert it into a game tree. Okay. Um, so let, let me actually let me let me go let me go on the slides. So here I really should have switched to this slide immediately because this is the answering the first question. Here's some intuitions for what this is. There does not exist a signature such that. This is an example, interesting layer two e logical proposition, right? For all blocks such that. The signature satisfies x and y, right? We have this, this, this logical connective and, yeah. You have to be really careful about there does not exist a signature in systems like this because there exists a signature, right? There is some string of bits that's a valid signature. Absolutely. So this is a great question. And not to not to skip the gun a little bit. Uh, logical omniscience. This is the problem that we face. So in theory, all signatures exist. In theory, in, in, from a logic perspective, all hash functions have an, an unlimited number of pre-images that satisfy the given hash, right? So we're going to talk about how to solve that problem. And one of the important future works that I hope will take, I can get out of someone in this audience, is to do a much better job analyzing that than I can because I did a very bad job and it's a minimal approach to be able to get this thing out there. Okay, so, spoiler alert. <coughs> okay, alright, okay, yes, so we have to be very careful about how we construct these things, but we're doing it in layer twos anyway, so it's, it's really just saying we have to be careful about how we do it in layer two. But again, this is an important distinction. So, even though in, in some logical interpretation, right, a semantics, uh, there is a semantics for like the, the, the like precise yeah. logical expression that says that this is always true because like all signatures exist out there, there's always a string of bytes. But we're going to provide a semantics, an interpretational logic, in which this can sometimes be false. Namely, if I haven't sent that signature to anyone else. So, uh, right, I mean, one of the standard approaches is to talk about a party having knowledge of a signature. Correct. Right, which is a different kind of statement. Correct. So, so, so there are lots of approaches to knowledge. So I, I, I went down a long rabbit hole on this. And it's like called Kripke semantics, um, which, which defines a set of worlds. W. You'll see something borrowed from that here in these slides. It defines an accessibility relation, a way to progress through worlds. So you, a world is accessible if it's in the future. If we want to talk about temporal logic to do with time, and uh, and there's one for knowledge as well, and so on and so forth. Um, we're not going to give a, a, a rigorous treatment of that here. What we're going to talk about today is just the first step in sort of, in sort of formalizing all of L2, which is let's just look at the games. Let's just look at the games. And so we'll do a very simple, crappy uh, job of the knowledge that is not rigorous and I don't think you could prove. Hopefully there's someone here or at DEF CON that I will be able to talk to that knows more about universal composability and these computability assumptions that's going to be able to inform you much better than I ever could. Uh, yes? Uh, that are specialized in the logic. I have, I have. So uh, I'm lucky enough to see a few of those faces in the crowd, um, and there, there's definitely more to speak to. Um, so one of the one of the goals of this work is to be able to pass that part off to someone else who can do this much better than I can, because uh, I, you know, I, you know, there's only so much time in a day, and, and I can't. But I can, I can, I can try to help. Okay. So uh, wait, other questions? Excuse me, I should not have done that yet. Other questions. Again, the goal is to not get through these slides, guys. I'm telling you, like, that is the, that is the successful stage here. So, ask away, ask away. Okay, but no questions, so let's get into it. Okay, so let's define this language that we're going to work with. Okay, it's a very simple four-story language. Okay, these guys are called quantifiers. Okay, this guy's for all the upside down a inverted a. Well, you know, I guess it's mirrored or upside down depending on you know how you want to treat it. This is your for all, also known as universal quantification. This is for all. It's like a sort of universal. This is, exists, it's called the dual of for all, it's existential quantification. So for all, right, so we actually, when we write this in practice, we write something like 
for all x in x, okay? And we write exists x uh, in x, right? And then we, this is like a such that, you know, like some p of x, right? Some p of x. Okay, and notably in, 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 in most logics, um, the, the, these two quantifiers are the duals of each other, so not, so this is, this, is our, this is going to be our not, by the way. So not for all not is the same thing as exists. And not exist not is the same thing as for all. OK, so that's just an interesting little tidbit there. Anyway, so the, then we're also going to use and, OK? So you're sort of up, uh, uh, upside down V or you know, inverted V, whatever, because we've got the same problem as the universal quantifier. This is your and, this is your not, this is your or. OK, good. Make sense? Yes. Yes, OK, excellent. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly talk about some notations that we will use um, within this language. So there are these, uh, I wrote a P over there that wasn't coincidental. So um, P and P sub 0 and P sub 1 are going to be our, uh, our sub-ins for a generic proposition, okay? So this is any expression in this language uh, which evaluates to true or false, okay? Uh, and technically that means it's closed, so there's no variable floating around in there. All the variables are well-defined. And it's well-formed, a.k.a., you know, uh, you, you know, the string not not with nothing after it is not, is not a well-formed proposition. It's just like this weird, vacuous statement that has no meaning, right? Yeah? Okay. Now, along with, uh, with, with propositions, we also have formulas, okay, which accept as an input some variable. So, for example, uh, x equals 5 is an example of a p of x, right? p of x, you know, uh, well, uh, sorry, x greater than 5 is an example of, uh, of a, of a, of a uh, formula because you can plug in different x's and they'll be true or false and they're free in x, right? Okay, that makes sense, everyone? Excellent, okay. And uh, we're going to use this weird notation um, for p of t. So th 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 this is a little tricky, but what we're doing here is we're plugging in t for x, okay? So, um, right, we, we, we say it out there in more fancy words than I can speak on stage. Um, but for example, for the p of x, x greater than 5, um, p of x slash 10 would be 10 greater than 5, right? Which would happen to be true, right? Good? Makes sense? Makes sense? Questions, comments, concerns? So cool. that notation is just the particular evaluation of p where x is equal to t? Correct. It's okay. a particular, you plug it in, you sub it, it Yeah, in. it's very hard to see the bottom. Of ah, the yes, OK, OK, well, apologies for that. Um, please shout out if you can't see things, um, and we will whiteboard them, or I will go out of full screen and zoom in, or whatever we need to do to make it work. Yes, exactly right. So in fact, why don't I just go ahead and do that? Um, so p of x, can you, can you read that? Maybe that's the same exact size. You can read that. Okay, so we've got some p of, so, so p of x. Let's say p of x, um, we'll define it with a dot dot equals this thing, you know, is x greater than 5. Then, you know, p of x, uh, which direction do I get slash? p of x slash 10 would, you know, would, 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 be, would be equivalent to um, 10 greater than 5. Okay, so we have x is free here, and now 10 has been substituted in some Good. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Now it happens. Oh, I have a microphone. <laughs> I don't need microphones. I don't need microphones. Okay, yeah. Do you need to read out the, the, the top line on the very right? I absolutely can. Uh, I'm sorry, is this the top line or is this? Okay, uh, yes. What does it state? Well, let's, re let's read it out loud. So there's actually two, there's actually, I'm going to just draw a dotted line here. There's actually two of them. Ah. So I'll read it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, so that's maybe what it's tricking you. Yes. So this expression read out loud says, for all x in x, so x, little x in big x, right? So this is the set, the domain of quantification, uh, p of x, okay? And uh, this says there exists x in x such that p of x, okay? Um, right. And so what we will see, right? What we'll end up seeing is we're going to be, we're going to start building up disputes where if someone says for all x in p of x, somebody else is going to say, nah, -ah, I have this x and I claim not p slash. What, you know, whatever the special case is that they're, that they're trying to discourage. Uh, just Great. Okay, other questions? Excellent. And how are we doing on time? Oh, great. I don't think we'll finish. It's fantastic. When do, when do we get out of here? 3.15? Does anyone know? Okay, let's call it 3.15. Okay, and then the last thing that we've got to cover in this language, which we, met, we touched on before, you've got atomic propositions. So if the other thing was too small, this is definitely too small. 
But what's a, what's a simple atomic proposition in equals? So actually that's a bit of a lie. Equals is, a, is, like, is like really a connective. So really, 5 equals 10. That's an atomic proposition. It evaluates to false, right? But, but things where, the, where both sides of the equals are filled become an atomic proposition. Greater than, there's another example, right? Less than, there's another example. OK, and then there's, there's three in particular which are going to be very interesting to us, building layer two things, which is, is this thing the hash preimage? So is this little h the hash preimage to this big h? Which basically is equivalent to saying hash of little h equals h, right? These are, the, these, are, these, are these two atomic propositions. Whoa, we got lights turned off. What's going on there? Uh -huh. Ah, thank you. No worries. No worries. Um, right, OK. Another one is verify signature, right? So we're all familiar with signatures in the wild west of uh, cryptocurrency. Signature is a very important. Actually, you can build a signature with a hash function, it turns out. Lamport, Leslie Lamport, great guy. Um, and the last thing, verify inclusion, okay, where you verify inclusion of the thing over. Yes? So, are all functions that evaluated to true or false atomic propositions, any function you can imagine? Um, so, I, I, I'm only hesitant, I, I, my, my intuitive answer is yes, and I think intuitively you should think of this as, no, 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 oh, actually. Without other Wait, Okay, so, no, 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 no. So, the, 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 the important thing, is that it is free of, um, of these logical connectives, okay? So if you have some ands and some nots and some ors or some quantifiers, this isn't. So A and B, where A are two atomic propositions, is not atomic. That might be breaking, I, I, I don't know, it's possible. I'm not a super, super deep logician, so it's possible that that's broken, but this is how I think about it. Um, but the big one that's, that, that, that is, makes it an atomic proposition is not having for all and exists, right? Not having quantification. That's, that's, that ends up being the big one. Um, yeah, great question, great question. So anything that evaluates a true or false is a proposition. An atomic proposition is one that doesn't have many of these, these bad boys in there because these are sort of indicators that there's more logical structure beyond just some sort of simple function evaluation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can go back to the current slide. Um, is there, yeah, with the, all the current stuff, yeah. Is there a reason for the inconsistent use of language where like, um, I mean the, Atomic propositions like is equal to is hash preimage, but all of a sudden, then you have, instead of like have is valid signature, you have like verify signature, which sounds like is that just by accident? Well, uh, it's certainly by accident. It's a it great call out. So I, you know, I should I should make a note to update the paper to have more consistency there. Yeah, yeah okay. I was actually the most egregious. I I would say that there's even more egregious inconsistency than that, which is that I should have in the parentheses here, you know, <laughs> signature message pub key, and I should have. Uh, you know the four inputs to verify inclusion, but absolutely, yeah. So that is that is my bad, my bad. Small <laughs> inconsistency, uh, but hopefully, hopefully, it gets the the point across. Yes. Um, are there quantifiers you don't like? Because like, if we're considering like atomic binary evaluation for those things, those are like cool. It's like built in, but it is it, it seems strange that you can't express like. Uh, player I know that there exists H, so that H is a preimage of H. Uh, and you want to say the knowledge, you want the knowledge, you want the knowledge to be a quantifier. Is yeah. That, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, so I, 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 this is why I'm excited to jam with you after this BI, because that's totally a valid question. So there's like, you can think of two layers happening here, okay? So the layer that we're going to cover mostly in all these slides is the on-chain layer, okay? And there's, there's a relationship to off-chain, but it's not as well-defined off-chain as it is for on-chain. What we're doing here is we're just building the dispute games that go on-chain, okay? So what we're going to end up doing is going to try to construct a contract that sort of implements the ability to check the truth or fa you know, false evaluation of these things. Um, so in, in, in sort of more, even less classical logics than these ones, the, the, my knowledge versus your knowledge is actually ends up being a quantifier. Um, that, that's absolutely right. We're going to ignore that for now. We'll, we'll treat that very simply. We'll, we'll have something called the computability model. It's not as well formed as, as, as to be like, you know, very, very well quantified, um, but you're absolutely right. But for now, for the intensive purposes of this, um, all we're going to think about is for all and exists. And, and it should be noted that there are many extensions to the semantics I'm going to cover here. Um, so, for instance, the binary search game, which the Trubit guys use, I've, I've, I've messed around with writing it as for all exists, for all exists, um, but I'm not sure if it doesn't denote its own quantifier or, uh, or, or connective. It, it, it might indeed want that. Right. Okay, other questions before we proceed? All right, let's get to it. So, what we want to do is we want to take these expressions, write things of, you know, the, the form of some of the things that are up there, and we want to turn them into games, okay? 
this is our goal. We want to so these logical expressions, we want to evaluate their sort of truthiness, whether they're true or false, in relation to some game. Okay, and eventually the goal is for this to be a game played on chain. It's going to correspond to the dispute contract or the deposit contract, you know, depending on what layer two protocol developer you ask. Um, so we're going to, we're going to, for now, we're going to talk about two players. It's going to be a prover P, and there's going to be an opponent O. Okay, that sounds good. And uh, and uh, as subends, A and B, capital A and capital B, are going to be variables representing either the prover or the opponent, such that A is not equal to B, but they might be one or the other. Okay, does that make sense? So uh, very often we want to talk about a player generically and we want to talk about uh, the, the, the other player generically. So we'll call one A and we'll call one B. Everyone good with that? Great, okay, okay. So these are the two people that are playing this imaginary game. And this game, again, is our interpretation of the logic. It's what gives the semantics, the meaning to the logic that we're gonna to try to make into layer two constructions. Good, great, okay. So here's a game state. So a game state is a tuple of two things. A player, remember A, like we said, is either the, this is either the prover or the opponent, uh, but we don't, we don't care about which at this point. We call this the defending player, okay? And the other thing here is the current proposition. You could also think of it as the proposition being defended by the defending player, okay? So this is a state of the game, okay? So if the game is currently in some position, uh, there's, there's gonna be a defending player specified and a current proposition specified. Right. Sound good? Sound good, everyone? Makes sense? Right. Simple. And what did I say here? Okay, yeah, so this is the same that some words which maybe the people in the back can't read. Uh, oh yeah, so we would we, we might say that this game state is A signed. I don't know, this is this is something that I found in a lot of game semantics logic. So an A signed state is one in which A is the defending player. Just a just an interesting little notation that I may or may not um, slip up and use through the rest of this presentation. Okay, that makes sense to everyone, right? Pretty straightforward. Okay, so the next thing we gotta define, now that we know what the state of a game can be, we wanna talk about how the state of a game can progress, right? How does it move through the iterations? Okay. The way that we're gonna do it is this will be a turn-based sequence of challenges, okay? So this is gonna be one game state, okay? And then something's gonna happen, this is gonna be the new game state, okay? And then something's gonna happen, this is gonna be the next game state, okay? Okay, does that sound reasonable, everyone? Makes sense? Right, and note that these are gonna be different propositions, okay? So I label this as P0, P1, P2, right? These are gonna be different uh, uh, expressions. Yeah. Makes sense so back, far? Always back and forth between B. What's that? Always back and forth between B. Always, always turn-based, yeah, right. always turn-based. Um, and one thing that's important to illustrate here is that we, these semantics that I'm going to define, uh, I know Sebastian's going to yell at me immediately after this for saying a bunch of things that don't reflect some of the nuances of things like copycat strategies and other lovely, strange things in very developed game semantics. But this will be sufficient to provide a, a, a this will be sufficient to, to provide me some intuition for why this is possible and what the contract that we want to build should look like. Uh, and so for our purposes, for the intuitive purposes, A says something, B says nah -uh, something else, A says nah -uh, nah -uh, something else, something else and so on and so forth, okay, cool, okay, yeah, cool. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, now we get the real meat and bones, okay? This is like the, the, the bee's knees of what we're gonna talk about here. Let's define the rules from which A, P0 goes to B, P1, okay? So here are the rules. Rule number one. Okay, well, and first of all, just talk about how this table is, okay? So this is a game state, and now the opponent, so B, here might, might or might not have to make a choice, might have to make, provide some input, okay? In this case, they don't. And this is gonna be our new resulting state, okay? So this is, our, this is our thing to the left of the arrow, this is gonna be our thing to the right of the arrow, okay? So we call these challenge rules. This is how the game is gonna progress through the steps. Make sense? Okay, so what's the first challenge rule? It's very, very simple. If A is defending a statement of the form not P, then B may challenge by claiming P. Okay, makes a lot of sense. I say that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the sky is not blue, and my opponent responds with, well, mm, the sky is blue. Okay, makes sense. Why is it not the other way around? Does it make more sense to A say it's P and B say it's not P? Because I say I have a balance of 50 and B says no you don't. Great question. Um, so, the reason that we want to avoid that um, is because what we want to do is we want to slowly take these very complex expressions and reduce them down. So for example, uh, if, if A could say P, and then B could say not P, then A could say not not P, and then B could say not 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 P, 
And then C can say not, not, not P, right? And so all we're doing is growing this like, logical expression. What we really want to do is make the expression smaller because we want to get down to something eventually that we can evaluate on chain very easily. Um, so that's a great question. And intuitively, this makes sense because I claim A, you can claim not A. But what we want to do is provide it in such a way that these games sort of reduce. Um, so, so that ends up being the reason. Yeah, great question, great question. But the intuition is there. The idea is that the game can transform in a way that if one person says something, the other person says something else that disagrees. So that, that, that's exactly the right intuition. OK, does this rule make sense? Nice. Here's a fun one. So if A says P0 and P1, then, I has a then, then B has a choice. B may either choose 0 or 1, may choose the left of the and or the right of the and, and B says not PI. Okay, so here's an example of where not does get added on, right? But we've reduced the and into something else, right? Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Sounds very logical. If A says the sky is blue and it is raining, then B may either say the sky is not blue or it is not raining, right? This is how this is how we respond. And so notably, if we were to be here, then the next then this rule would apply, right? And A and B are sort of switched now, right? But now but now we would get the A over here eventually saying PI. Right? And so this should start to give an intuition for how these games progress. Right? Okay, here's another one, or. Right? So or is something that either if the left is true or the right is true, then it's true. So what happens if A says P0 or P1, then B has to respond by saying not P0 and not P1. Right? So the only way for this statement to sort of be false is if both of these things are false, because this is what the or does. It's conjunction or disjunction or something like that in logic. Right? Um, so does that make sense to everyone? This one is bigger. Ah, this one is bigger. So it, it is bigger, that's true, but now it feeds into this rule. So right, so so notably, like, you know, this this, this outcome has uh, is able to have this rule applied to it, and this outcome is able to have this rule applied to it, which will then be able to have this rule applied to it. So what we'll find is that even though this one kind of looks a little bigger because there's now two knots and an and as opposed to just one or, eventually things will reduce down. We'll always get smaller and smaller. Yeah. So it's not size question. distance from like, a core composition. Say that, say that. No, it's not size, it's actually distance from a core composition. Yeah, it's, a, it's some intuitive reduction. The goal is to eventually get around, so we're just like checking one signature, right? So in the verify multi-sig example that I gave, we want to say for all P less than participants, right? The great thing about doing the multi-sig this way is you can disprove the multi-sig not by checking all the participants, but by simply providing the one that's not true, okay? And so this ends up being what happens a lot in, in, in layer two protocols. For example, in Plasma, you make a rule that says for all blocks less than the one I'm exiting from, this condition is satisfied. It would be very expensive and it would break the scalability of your system to check all those blocks on chain. But instead, you only check the individual ones that people decide to respond to. Yeah, great question. Okay, well, I'll, I'll others before we continue. Great. Okay, so here's, here's a fun one. Okay, this is this one things maybe get a little more hairier. These are, these are pretty, pretty straightforward. Now we're going to throw in the two quantifiers. The first one we'll talk about is the existential quantifier. Okay? So the existential quantifier, let's just, let's just read this statement. A is defending the proposition. There exists x such that p of x. Okay? So how do we respond to this? The way that b is allowed to respond to this is to say, uh-huh, I disagree. For all x, not p of x. Okay? So this should make sense. So if I say, every day in the last year, uh, or, or, or there, there was a day last year when it rained, okay? Someone else can respond and say no. Every day last year it did not rain, okay? So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. It should be fairly intuitive. And again, these are all very intuitive, right? We're just providing a particular formulation of something that seems very obvious, right? There's not, nothing very, very hard or counterintuitive about these rules. Okay, so now we have the last one, and as well as the caption, which is now I got to uncrop that part too. Um, the universal quantifier, and this is, this is, a, this is a big one. So if A says for all x, p of x, B may choose a particular t in x and say not p of t replaced in x, or, or yes, q replaced for x, okay? So if, 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 if player A says it rained every day last year, player B can say it did not rain on January 3rd of last year, right? Um, so the, 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 this seems this seems this is a very important one. It is one of the things, one of the main things that gets us the scalability of these solutions is that only we only we can evaluate whether something is true for all of these things with this dispute assumption by simply only analyzing particular ones that people are claiming it's not true for. 
So this is, this is, the, this is the, really the key, the, the meat and potatoes of our scalability under this construction. Yes? Could, could all these rules lead to infinite challenges? Ah, great question. Could all these rules lead to infinite challenges? My gut says no. I don't have a proof for you, so I won't say that absolutely. But my gut says no. Um, and I think, that would, I think that would hold up. Uh, and there's lots of results. So this is, by the way, I very, very close to stole this from this dialogical logic thing. This is very, very, very similar to like dialogical logic. And in dialogical logic, there are lots of results that say that, uh, a, a semantics that are very similar to the structure, a few differences, but very similar, exactly correspond to things like classical logic. There's another version that corresponds to intuitionistic logic. There's another that corresponds to linear logic and all these other and blah, blah, blah. I think there's one for dependent types, because apparently types are also logics. I don't know. I don't know any of that. But uh, I, I believe that there would be a result that would say this would always reduce, and there wouldn't be anything in there. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. These things are sort of getting smaller, and I, I don't see any place where we would start looping through anything. Okay. Um, uh, question? Yes? Does the left two does not go into the loop? Sorry, could you speak up a little bit? Yeah, sorry. The last two conditions, what, can you explain why they, they go into a loop? Ah, so they don't go into a loop. So it exists, turns into a for all. But a for all does not turn into exist. A for all just gets rid of the for all and puts a not in front. Right? So, 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 so maybe, maybe I'll just do a progression out, okay? So let's say someone says um, exists x in x such that p of x. Okay, um, and let's say let's say a a says this, and the next thing we would have we would have b saying for all x in x p of x, and then we would have a saying again a would pick a particular t, and a would say not not p of t. Okay. okay. So particular and not just. Yeah, so the, so the, the for all doesn't loop back into exists, so we're okay. We're good. We're good. No infinite loops as far as I've been able to see. So for the last one, it's, that means uh, it exists P, which means uh, the PT is not, uh, not PT, right? The, the last one? Uh, the, so the middle one says, so let, let, me, let me just read this off. A says, <coughs> A says, uh, there was a day last year such that it rained. B says, for all days last year, it did not rain. A says, it did not not rain on January 12th of last year. Okay, and of course the not not will eventually resolve into B saying not P, and then A saying P. As we would expect, not not reduces to, not not P reduces to P. Okay, does that, does that help? Cool, cool. Oh, screen died. Um, other questions? I thought I thought I said yes. Does the challenge game allow you to backtrack? I mean, like for example, if someone says that for all previous blocks, the statement A holds, and then the other guy says, oh, it doesn't hold for block uh, zero, and then the other guy says, no, it holds for block zero. But the the other guy said, oh, I actually meant uh, it doesn't hold for block one. But that's happening. Great question. So just to reiterate the question so everyone can hear, the question is, do we allow uh, sort of replays? Do we allow, do we allow, if so, may, maybe some guy says for all blocks, some guy says not for this block, but really it was not for this block. And if we went not for this block, we might get stuck down this wrong trail when the right trail was over here. So we have a contract design that basically makes it so that A and B, these pr the pr where really P and O, the approver and the opponent, are like these sort of imaginary players. We replace that which, with one in which anybody can sort of play on behalf of P and O. So what we go is from one string of plays to trees of plays. And so this allows you multiple people to dispute multiple blocks all in parallel, uh, and it works out. So great question, yeah, great question. Yeah. Others, others. Cool, okay. So um, with that, there's one last thing to cover, which is what the heck happens at the end of this game, right? That's the one thing that we haven't gone over. What the hell is going on at the end? Game outcomes. So the game's going to end when we hit an atomic proposition. So for example, over here, if we assume if the P had been an atomic proposition, the next thing we'd get here was B saying not P of this thing, right? And then we'd have A saying P, all right? And now we don't know how to reduce it any further, okay? 
So when we can't reduce it any further, this is when the game is either won or lost. Okay? And it, the, the outcome that you assign is quite as you would expect. If A is true, then, so let's say the game state, so, pardon me, the game state is BA, right? So again, B is one player, either the proof of the opponent, we don't know which, uh, but not the same as A. Uh, and some atomic proposition A, so I have a little A for this atom, okay? So if the game state has ended in BA, then if A is true, right, because again, atomic propositions have a truth value associated with them. If A is true, then B wins, right? Therefore, A loses. But really, B can win. Right? Because if you were to actually play the game, B could make a mistake and lose. Ah, yes, absolutely right. So we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. But for right now, all we're going to be doing is talking about if the game had ended this way. So what you're talking about is the behavior of how people play the game. So if I say for all days last year, I could definitely lose depending on which day I pick if I pick the wrong day. Right, and this matters because you can't, if you actually play the game between two players in a real system, you can't go back and say, well, A won, therefore A must have been right in the beginning. Uh, that's correct. So you, so there, there actually are layer two designs that um, correspond to doing precisely that. And I, I actually think that it's a pretty reasonable design. Um, so uh, maybe that would be, it would be too much of a sidetrack to get into that all now. But there are cases in which maybe you might want to be lenient in that way, because it does give you some advantages. Um, but it's a, it's a good point. I mean, from a security standpoint, you take the fact that A that the fact that A won the game doesn't establish that little A was true in the beginning. Right? So you would need an additional argument about incentives somehow. Absolutely. So um, you would have to make to get to any kind of conclusion. Absolutely right. right. However, if you make the assumption that Everybody knows that if any game plays out that involves them in some way and it's one, then we assume all the possible sub-games that could have been played out would have been one. Then that's okay. So there, there's nuance there, and I, and I know and I know the hesitation that you have, so you can't go through multiple turns. It's only like, the, really, if a game was won, all possible challenges would have been lost. That's really the assumption that you can make, that other layer two protocols make. But that's not correct, right? If you and I play chess and you win, right, it doesn't mean that um, well, it could. It doesn't mean that I never had a sure win position on the board. It might be that I actually had a winning position, I just missed it. Right. So th this is the case. However, there are some layers. This, this is a bit of an aside, so I, I, I'll try to keep it relatively short. But there are some cases in which we can make that. And particularly, we're OK making that assumption if we tell you ahead of time, hey, buddy, your life depends on this chess game because every other chess game that is, you're playing next in the future is going to be dependent on whether you're able to win this. It's one. okay if I suffer because the game came out that way, but if everybody else suffers because I messed up the game. Very true. That's a design problem. Very true. So, so, so some of the major design problems there we can tackle, and the ones that are sort of a, uh, you know contextual subjective decisions you might want to or not make, want to make or not make in your layer two protocol. Um, th those are choices that you can make. Yes. Oh. Is it the game that you're playing, the game on the results of the game that was already played? In which case, like, you would already know who won the chess game, and so now you're playing a game of, like, did you win the chess game or not? Is that not it? But even so, if Ben won the chess game, I might, he might mess up. The, then we play a game about who really won the chess game. If he makes a mistake, I could win the second game and convince the room that I beat him in chess. Right? And then all the people who put down bets on him have to pay me. But isn't it like obvious? Um, even though they deserve to. If I make like a mathematical claim and then someone says no, but I have a count example and the count example turns out not to be true, that doesn't mean that my claim is, is correct, but someone right. else can find a valid count example. But in just mine, for example, if you have like an yeah. exit claim, like like, like, a, like a, during the exit period, like a claim that, uh, that's invalid and the claim turns out not to be true, other people can still submit other claims, right? Or, uh, as Absolutely as, right. So, 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 so like one claim, one failed claim doesn't mean the they're like the con there's no contest anymore. Right. So, yeah. that, that, that's maybe an, an illuminating example. I think uh, I think we'll cut it short because th there's a there's a whole separate discussion. What we're doing right now is pretty separate from the way that you implement a contract. And so one of the key things that you want to do when you turn these semantics into like a smart contract that you're running on a blockchain is that if someone else makes the wrong move and you know that they're making the wrong move, you can't let that screw them over. You have to be able to sort of go like start a new sub a new game from a different point in the tree where you make the move that you believe is right. And so there's a contract design that allows you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
But anyway, maybe let's continue here because this could be a very long discussion. It's one I want to have. Um, but I also, I, well, I said I didn't want to get through all the slides. But I want to get through a couple more. I want to get through a couple more. Okay. Great. Okay. So does this make sense to everyone? You're defending some game. And you're defending something. If you're defending something that's true, you won. If you're defending something that's false, you lost. Right? Make sense? Cool. Excellent. Okay, come on, mouse. Here we go. Okay, so now we have a game tree. Now we can make a game tree. So let's 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 define two atomic propositions, F and T. What will they what will they how will they be assigned truth values? You guessed it, F is false, T is true. Okay? Can everyone read this by the way? It's possible that some people can't read this. Okay, seems like we're doing okay. Great. So game tree for false or true. So the game always starts with the prover. I haven't mentioned that yet, but it's pretty obvious the game is initiated by the prover. It's, they're the one trying to prove it. So they make the first defense of the thing being proven, okay? So false or true. So P says false or true. Now there's only one response, according to the challenge rules that O has, which is to say not false and not true, right? So that, that is according to rule, uh, rule number three here, right, right here. P0 or P1, not P0 and not P1, right? So false or true, not false and not true, right? Make sense? Follow? Okay, so now we have an and, right? And so for an and, P now has a choice. P can either say not on the left or not to the right, okay? So let's say P chooses I equals zero, AKA the left. Now P is going to say not the thing on the left, which is not not false, okay? And of course not not false by P, is retorted by not false by O, which is retorted by false by P, right? And so of course this game outcome is gonna be one by O, right? So the reason that it's one is because F is an atomic proposition, it's false, because P is defending a, a, a false atomic proposition, it's one by P. So does that, does that side make sense? Yeah. One by O. Great. Okay, of course the other side is gonna be the case where one, which is the side that you should always pick, if someone says not false and not true, well you should obviously make you know go ahead and say uh, not not true, right? Because that, that's true. So we have not not true, the same thing happens, we reduce reduce to not true, and then we reduce to true, and that's one by P. Okay, so for false or true, we have now taken this expression, this this uh, expression in the syntax, just the language of first order logic. And we've interpreted it as this tree. Does it, is, is everyone is everyone here? Good. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So that's great. So now we've defined a tree. But we still haven't answered the question: What does it mean for this thing to be true or false? We've interpreted this expression as a tree. Now, how do we look at this tree and understand whether or not the thing is actually true or false? Right. So that that's going to be the next question that we're going to ask. And the answer is going to be strategies. Okay. So what is a strategy? And I promise we're almost through, we're almost to the good stuff, the finding way to protocols, so close. All right. So, so of course, uh, a strategy is a subtree. And actually, maybe I'll just skip to the TLDR of the game strategy, which is a strategy for player A is where you start off with the base state, and you look at all the possible challenges that B could make, right? What's everything that B could say if I said, if, I, if player A said the first thing, right? So for all challenges, right, a winning strategy says, if, says for all the challenges that B could have done, A has to have a response to that. I have to be able to deal with that case. So you look at all the challenges by B, you pick a specific counter challenge, oh, that should say A. So you specific, pick a specific counter challenge, um, oh, and I'm offline. Okay, that thing highlighted right there is A, I promise you, I swear. Um, hopefully I can hit present again. Oh, baby, okay. All right. We're, no, no, no worries. My, unless my phone dies, we're going to be good. Okay. Um, yes. So, a strategy is when player A says, okay, I'm playing A. I'm going I'm to win this. What's my strategy here? Right? Okay, my strategy is I'm going to look at all the possible things that B could do. I don't want to pick what I'm going to do in response. Right? And then, for everything that's done in response, what are all the things that they could do in response to that? And for each one of those, I've got to pick something unique as well. Okay? And so this defines a strategy for player A, right? So, for example, um, uh, let's see, are we going to get a reload here? Hey, yes, excellent. What slide was that? 46. Excellent. Ah, oh, and I can fix it. Hey. Hey. Okay. Right, and then so we repeat this process, right? So we, 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 we let, me, let me just go to the board because maybe the board is going to be useful here. So at a high level, what is a strategy? Let's, let's look at a strategy for the prover P, okay? So we have some, some root state here, right? This is, you know, P 
uh, you know, P, whatever. I'm, I'm not going to write out the, the, this thing for all the examples, right? But what is a strategy for the proof of P? A strategy is we look at all the possible uh, next nodes in the tree, right? So these are all the things uh, that could be played by O, okay? So these are all going to be in the form O something, O something else, O something else, right? And so P has to account for every, every single one of those, right? So every, everything that O says, P's got to have an answer, okay? So what that means is we're going to pick one answer for each of these that P is going to play in response, right? So these are played by O, now these are played by P, okay? So P uh, said one thing, P has to be able to say, okay, here's all the things that O can say, and here's what I'm going to say in response. This is my strategy. Does that make sense? It's what I'm choosing to play in response to anything possibly that can be played on my opponent. And so again, this could repeat, right? So for example, imagine maybe you know maybe the game maybe the game terminates terminates here, and this is like the end. But for this one, there's more stuff that could happen, right? So these are all you know you know uh, counter 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 claims by O. Now again, P has to be able to not nominate a unique response to each of these. Okay. So in effect, what we get is that it, 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 you know perhaps O could have made this decision or you know this decision as well could have made these moves, but we want to pick just one, right? So this this has to be chosen. 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 This. So these are all unique, and then all possible plays by the opponent uh, have to be have to be enumerated. Does that make sense? This is this is a strategy. Anything that my opponent does, this is what I'm going to do. Anything he does after that, this is what I'm going to do. Right? That's a strategy. Does this make sense? Questions, comments, concerns? All right. Well, let's look at a strategy. So we just did the game tree a moment ago for false or true. Okay. And it turns out the strategy is very easy to look at. Uh, it turns out that our strategy, ah, what a shocker, is one of these. So notably, this subtree or this subtree are both strategies, okay? The strategy here turns out to be pretty easy because we've got a lot of knots here. We've got a lot of things where there aren't many choices to be made. So if P says this, O only has one response. So P has to, but, but, but now for, for, for O's response, a strategy for P has to either choose one or the other action to make, okay? So let's say P's gonna choose this action, okay? Now, of course, we have the response by O, and then P chooses a response again. Now there's not many branches here, right? So it's very easy to see that P is going to win this. Uh, but this is a strategy. Does it make sense to everyone how this would be a strategy? So is, it, so is this interactive or is this not interactive? Uh, is this interactive or not interactive? So the the this so this this without any highlights, this tree here is the full possible set of all interactions. Okay? So so these games are definitely interactive. Right? They're, 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 they're meant to be describing P and O interacting by challenging and counter challenging and counter counter challenging and counter counter counter. counter right? So this defines all the possible actions. Yeah. Okay? A strategy for one player defines the specific action that they are going to take, that they could take, in response to all possible actions by the other player. Okay? So every time we so a, a strategy for P, every time we have a, a, a play by O, we enumerate one particular response by P. So it's my strategy because I chose which one I'm going to do. Okay, so like realistically, like O would not send that first one. He would just jump down to the last time he sends an interaction, and then P would also time it. Correct. So realistically, if we want to make this an efficient, smart contract, we don't want to have a timeout for this part, right? Because this is more just like a proof. This is, this is a proof, yeah. So in, in reality, obviously, not not always reduces to not, and not, you know, not not, yeah, not always reduces to the thing and not not always reasons to the thing, right? And so obviously this would all be compressed into one dispute period in, in the actual smart contract implementation. Right? But we'll, we'll ignore that for here because we're just trying to mm, and give some meaning, some semantics, and that's like a, you know an implementation deal. Yeah. So uh, to take this like in another example, is this similar to how like tic tac toe is a solved game and there is a strategy to always win tic tac toe? Exactly right. Exactly okay. right. Yeah. So like the the first. Uh, assertion, I, I don't remember what you call them, but the first on the left side is like setting up the game board for tic-tac-toe and exactly then... Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. And the next steps are all the games. But in our case, the game board is not a tic-tac-toe board. No, the game a, board is a is a logical statement, and the logical statement progresses through each thing. Yes? 
And this is why for a layer 2 protocol, you would not play chess, you would play tic-tac-toe. Because we always want to know that we have our money. We don't want to have to compute in, exactly. ultimately, you know, not infinite, but a massive set of strategies. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So chess wouldn't be very useful under this framework. Oh, is chess solved? I don't know. Maybe AI has solved like, all the games possible. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know. There, there's some game which is unsolvable. We wouldn't want to apply this framework to it. We want solvable games. Yeah. So would he really have to enumerate all strategies or just enumerate as low and stop as soon as he finds a winning strategy? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, just as a final one. Yeah, we, we, to, to have a secure layer two. another for all that they're taking me. Um, you don't have to find all, you just absolutely find, right. find one strategy that leads to the outcome you intend to have, and then Absolutely the right. You don't continue. So to have safety in a sense of layer two, what we want to say to say that a protocol is safe in layer two is that the winning strategy can always be found by the person you know defending their money that's up at stake in this deposit contract. Yeah. Yes. But it's possible to calculate all the different possibilities because if we have a graph that is huge, like we end up with like just a brute forcing all the strategies, and we need to have a way to select one over another because otherwise we would take like just like maybe one day to actually just select the best strategy ever on this giant chain or whatever. So how do you do that on a really complex set of data? So what we're not doing here is proposing that all logical expressions can be interpreted as a different layer two game that is meaningful. Most of the expressions that we interpret with the semantics are not going to be meaningful. They're going to be unsafe protocols, they're not going to be useful, maybe they're not going to be able to move money around, whatever. The point is that we can find some of them that do correspond to layer two protocols. So particularly state channels, plasmas, uh, things like Truebit and Optimistic Rollup, all of these things are very simple games which do have computable winning strategies. So like Carl said, you don't, you don't make chess out of this, you make tic-tac-toe something that is playable. Right? So this is, what, this is what layer two protocols were, uh, developers were doing when they invented state channels. They, they didn't realize it, but they were finding these sequences of expressions, these challenges and responses, in which the client could like, have a chance at actually computing what's going on. Yes. Could you do something like Turing complete, uh, maybe Sedan Misfit, and then do chess on top of like that type of architecture? Absolutely. Absolutely you could. So state channels are a great example of this. I can play a, a chess game in a state channel, but the dispute game is not going to be about it's not going to be me finding my winning strategy for the chess game. It's gonna be me finding the winning strategy for proving the highest signed, mutually signed nonds to the smart contract, and that's the channel stuff. And the chess stuff is a layer on top of that. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yes. It seems like finding like finding the correct finding if you have a winning strategy for the for all is kind of hard because you have a like you need to find the team. Absolutely right. And so and so the for all in practice, there, there, there's two ways to there, there's two common ways to be able to compute for alls. So one for all that we can compute pretty easily is if we say for all things such that signed by such that signed by me. I know exactly what I signed and I can enumerate that. So that's a nice for all. Another for all that we use in plasma is for all blocks less than x. And that one we can enumerate because we just have to go with x, x minus 1, x minus 2 to 0. So it's a finite set. And so absolutely. There are tons of games here that we can come up with that are not computable and are like very, very hard to reason about. But some of them turn out to be layer 2 protocols. And so we think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Other questions? Great questions. Yes? So like each step, like each step in the tree itself, it would add an extra dispute period, should, right? In theory, each step we have to add a dispute period. In reality, when you actually add a dispute period, this is, what, this is what was mentioned earlier, is only when there's a choice to be made. So particularly the time that really uh, ends up getting, get, you have to add an extra timeout, is when you have a new for all or an and, and you have to make a choice, either not the left side of the and or not the right side of the and. But, but, but you can, des you, and you can and should design the contract so that the expression not dot t is automatically reduced to t because this is the only possible place. So why play a timeout? It can automatically be reduced. Yeah, yeah, but like in, for example, in Plasma MVP or more MVP style, like each, like every game has to share the same period. So like from the start to the end, they have to be in the same period. Like you cannot have different games having different periods. Yes, so actually, so, so, so we, we touched on this in the paper. MVP is one of the very interesting examples of games that doesn't fit into this semantics define. You need a new connective to do it. The, 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 the logical connective, so uh, to not be playing inside baseball here, uh, Plasma MVP, the sort of like original spec for Plasma, had this thing called an exit queue. And basically there could be like uh, uh, transactions forged and inserted by this malicious user. And the way that you prove that they were 
uh, forged or malicious was you proved that the sum of all the UTXOs um, that led up to the forged ones was equal to the total amount deposited into the contract. And so this actually seems to be like a summation operation. So we would need to define some sort of MVPQ um, summation operation. So that hasn't been done, been done in this because there's a lot to do without that. But you're absolutely right. That's a, that's a great example of more sort of game interactivity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, other questions? All right. Well, I like him, so keep him coming. Okay, where, where were we? Okay. Ah, okay, great. So this is an example of a winning strategy. Why is it winning? Because every possible leaf, every game outcome was won by P. So a winning strategy is, is, uh, is one uh, in which all of these branches result in a win. Okay, so if we go back here, right, we, we enumerated the, the, so for instance, tic-tac-toe has a winning strategy, right? Because we can enumerate all the responses by the opponent, and then one, pick, one particular play after that, and so on and so forth, and they're all won. So if these are all one, then this is a winning strategy for P, because they've all been won, right? And so what this corresponds to in layer two world is the reason that I know I have some money is because I know whatever, however someone tries to dispute me, whatever they do, I'm gonna be able to win that outcome, okay? And, and like, this is why I have some layer two state. It's because I have a winning strategy that proves that that state is legitimate. So we can sort of interpret the truth of these expressions based on whether or not there's a winning strategy in the tree uh, for that, for the particular ex that corresponds to the particular expression. Make sense? Nice. Nice. Other questions, comments, concerns. Cool. And so, so some interesting notes on this. One of the ways that you can understand uh, the not is it reverses the roles, right? So if you have the uh, expression p, right? Not p. P's bad. Not p re reverses the rules, right? Reverses the roles. Pardon me. Versus, so if, if someone's trying to prove P, then it's like the opponent is trying to prove not P, okay? So this reverses the roles. So if there's a winning strategy for P, then there's not a winning strategy for O. And if there's a winning strategy for O, there's not a winning strategy for P. So thankfully, we've recovered that at least. So what this means is that if P is sort of true because it is a winning strategy, then O, then, then not P will be false because now the other guy is the opponent. So the guy who had the winning strategy is now the one who's going to win, but he's now the opponent as opposed to the prover. Um, so this is, this is sort of good. We've recovered some of the intuitive properties of other logics and other semantics in which if statement A is true, statement, the statement not A is false, right? So we've at least, we've at least recovered that. Yeah. Okay, I want to pause for questions. I don't know why I had this slide and I paused for one more question. Uh, you know, uh, I'll do it once again. Okay, okay, okay. Great. But what about cryptography? Okay, so this is something that we've totally ignored up to now. And this is something that does add a, a, a more complexity. Most of what we've done over here, very, very, very similar to existing uh, works in, in game semantics and biological logic and these things. The complex uh, nature that comes about is in layer two protocols, the, tr the truth of a particular proposition changes off chain. So for example, there's a game corresponding to a channel, a state channel exit, right? It basically is a claim that says, uses this multiple, multi sig exists which we erased before that says, I claim that this is a valid state because I claim for all states higher than this, for all nonces higher, there does not exist a multi sig signed by everyone. And so that is what a state channel is. So let's say that that's state n. That's true at time x. Maybe at time x plus one, we sign the next nonce. Well now, this statement is false because this one is true here, right? And so there's some notion in, in the layer two world that is subjective truth. It's not, that the, it's not like true or false, which is obviously true, right? Like this, the expression true or false, duh, that's true. Like no duh, true or false, right? But the expression signature exists or hash pretty much exists, that's dependent on what the players know and what they're allowed to play. Exactly, this, this is the point, that it's not that the facts, it's not that what exists abstractly changes as the player's knowledge changes. Right, exactly right. So player's knowledge about particular um, uh, data changes over time, and this changes the computability of what's going on, right? So we have a, we have a, we have a model for this, right? Uh, th this problem is called logical omniscience, right? And so we have a problem for this. Uh, 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 and this is, uh, we have a solution for this, rather. It's a problem, we have a solution, there we go. Okay, so 
I definitely won't claim to you that it is nearly as advanced as the rest of the massive amounts of work that have gone into the systemization of knowledge and cryptographic knowledge and computability. It's not, but it's enough to, to be a proof of concept to demonstrate that we can express uh, layer two systems as uh, you know, as logical expressions and sort of unify them all under one framework, okay? So the way we think about it is we define some set W, and this is like a set of worlds, okay? So one world in this set might say, Alice has the private key K, but she's not signed anything, okay? Another world might say, Alice possesses the private key K, and she signed message M and sent it off to the opponent. So the opponent knows about, uh, about Alice's signature, but only on the message M, right? And so as we progress through these worlds, the, that progression, so Alice might have started out not having signed anything, and then at, at world zero, and then at world one, she assigned a message M. This is what will allow us to change a statement from true or false. Because in this world, um, it's not true for anything that there exists a signature by Alice. In this world, it's true for message M that there is a signature by Alice. And so this progression through worlds is what you actually do when you execute a layer two protocol and you, and you send money around off chain in doing so. Make sense? So we, we, we can define this uh, a little more precisely by saying there's a computability, a computable subset, okay? So we call this XCOM, okay? And, uh, and this is like the set notation, but what you really care about is it's a function. It takes the current world and, the, and, the, and which player it is, either, either the prover or the opponent, and it returns some subset of the total state which they can compute, which they are therefore allowed to play, okay? So for example, in a, in a world where Alice is not saying anything, Bob cannot play her signature as a challenge. So if the world W here says Alice has not signed anything, then X computable is a subset of X which does not include Alice's signature, and therefore, you know, exists such that signed by Alice will end up being false. End up being false. Okay, so in practice, how do we, how, how, this has to affect the game somehow. So the way that we can affect the semantics is we change the final challenge rule, right? So we have those five challenge rules before, the universal quantifier for all. We've now changed it. So instead of T in X, we can only pick tech T in the computable subset of X in the current world by the current player who's going to be providing the challenge. So this is a, now a subset of the tree. So whereas before, all possible things were known by the logic, and therefore all possible things could be played in a theoretical notion. Now we might say we're in a particular W0 in this set of worlds. And in this world, uh, you, know, you know, maybe this was false, right? But in this world, it turns out that O cannot play, cannot play this branch. So we're good, right? So we still have a winning strategy. Because in this world, this cannot be computed. It's impossible for O to play it, because its computer is only finite, it, it only knows the things that it's downloaded off of the internet, and because Alice has not, signed any, has not signed the thing, and therefore it could not have been downloaded from the internet or computed, then this, this game state is inaccessible. So we restrict these sort of theoretical game trees which, to only ones which are computable moves, right? Only, the only way to play something is if your computer can get in there and punch the numbers and play it. Um, and now note, of course, that in each world W, there's a different game tree, right? So maybe in W0, right, maybe in W0, this was not playable. But maybe in W1, now this is playable again, right? Maybe, you know, I, I don't know how to erase an X. There we go, okay. So maybe, maybe in this world, it is playable again, right? So if it is playable again, well now this thing becomes false because the strategy doesn't check out, right? The strategy doesn't work because this is lost, okay? And so what this means, is that as we progress through worlds, propositions can go from being true to being false. It's no longer meaningful to interpret the truth of a statement in a vacuum. You have to interpret it in the particular computability world, or whatever you want to call it, that corresponds uh, to the state of affairs, right? And so we, we say that now there is a strategy that is winning or losing uh, in world W, and therefore we say that, that a, a, a logical proposition is true or false in world W. It's not in a vacuum, it's not true or false on its own, it's true or false in world W. Make sense? So in practice, the world W that you're going to be tracking is, for instance, what have I signed? Yes? So in this example, what the party can't compute is whether they would win or lose if they went down that right path, or is it that they can't compute, they can't even ah, compute so what the choice is? They, no, so what it is, is they can't compute the move, therefore they can't play it. 
So the game tree is... So they don't even know what their set of moves is. Um, they know what their set of moves is. It's whatever their computer can come up with, right? So, 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 but they, but, right? So, so for, for example, more importantly, I know that my opponent can never come up with my signature unless I've given it to them. And that's a really important one. And so that allows me to restrict the subtree. So you're, essentially, you're taking the original tree and you're just pruning out the steps. Exactly right. You're pruning out any moves which are computationally infeasible to have been played in the first place. And this is what, what removes the logical omniscience problem and makes things true and false subjectively. Yep. So I have a set of moves that I can, if in the game, my, one of the moves I can play is to exhibit Alice's signature on some string, right? There's a set of strings of a certain length that I know I can play. It's not that I, it's not that I don't know that, that I, I am allowed to play that string of bits. It's just that I don't know that's the string I should play in order to win. It's that I don't know that I, I can't figure out uh, among okay. the enormous number of moves that are available to me, which of them is winning. Okay, so maybe I've, 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 I've more loosely than I should have thrown around allowed. So it's not really allowed, it's really capable, right? The game tree is restricted because people are incapable of playing moves that are not computable by their computers. So, so maybe, maybe, that, uh, maybe that refinement of wording would help, would help there. Okay. I mean, let's, talk, let's take this offline. Yeah, we'll take it offline. Excellent, okay. And how are we doing on time, by the way? Okay, we got about 10 minutes. Um, other questions, other questions. Can you, it, so when you look at, when you look at the traversal, this is, this is very reminiscent if you want to, to see what is the set of winning strategies based on a, on, on a, on a certain truth, is the basic, basically what's the support, right? So you could, you could compute half the rules over these, right? To, 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 to see, you know, because the, the, the path, the, the path over the ones that are that are that are not computable will give you zero, right? right? Because there's no support, right? But if you're if you're if you're if you're integrating the path over the worlds, w d d w i, you're 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 going, you can express it through paths that you can actually because it's you can treat this as a power series, you can then ex um, exponentiate them. So so that that's so that now now you actually. Now you actually have a have a have a have a corresponding. Now you can can, can compute total 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 values of, of, of sets of sets of strategies. Beautiful path integrals. I didn't know they applied, but that sounds great. So this is that's, <laughs> let's talk after. This is exactly what I'm trying to do here: is make up something that sounds legit enough that you believe me that L2 will be supported by it, but then you can stick on your actual knowledge of computability and cryptography because mine is woefully inadequate to deal with these sort of systemic problems. That's yeah. actually that's actually more quantum field theory. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> that's okay. Which more not me. Why don't you? That's great. Okay. Absolutely. So let's jam after. Yeah. In general, I'll be around after. Everyone who wants to come. Let's come talk about this stuff. Okay. So like a very a very simple computability model that you can build, which is one that we sort of deal with in, 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 in this paper, which may or may not be of course be accurate at all, is maybe maybe the way that we define our worlds is we say that the world is that the world that the set of worlds is defined by three things: a set of public information, a set of secret information to P, and a set of secret information to O. Right? And we maintain the rule, whatever the world is in particular, we say that in all worlds it holds true, that if some, X, some, some, some set element X is in the secret information of A, then it is not in the public information. Okay? So if A, if A has some secret information, it is not in the public information. Right? And then further we say the computable, the computable moves that can be played is the intersection of all possible moves with the public information set. So what this means is that if X is in I, uh, IB secret, then therefore it's not in I public, and therefore it's not in this intersection and it's not playable. So this is a very simple, very rudimentary way to try to restrict these game trees. It probably has nothing to do, I mean, you know, we, we want to hit this with like universal composability and get it, you know, get an actual security model that corresponds to crypto slapped on it. This is probably not it, but it gives you a good intuition for what's going on. Um, yes, yes. Quick question. Uh, it, it's public, but is it known for, for, for either P? Uh, yeah, so we'll cover we'll, we'll, this, right? 
Right, so we'll say the public, the public information is known by both parties, that's why we're calling it public, right? And so maybe this isn't accurate to the meaning. So for example, if we extend this to the end party world, in which there are many different player people playing things, there's not one public set of information. There's a set of information that I have downloaded, and there's a set of information that's secret to me that I know that no one else has downloaded, but maybe the local information that is public that I have downloaded is not, is not, is not that downloaded by someone else, right? So there's many more complex models you can build, far more complex models, and that's what we need. We need a better model. Uh, but this is a very simple one that we can throw together just to pull out the core sort of elements of what goes on in layer two. Other questions? We've got five minutes, which I'm pretty pleased because we're pretty much there. Um, okay, so a really simple example with this very, very, very simple model, which again, probably not accurate to the computer science out there, but it's accurate enough to give us a layer two game tree that actually corresponds to what really is done on chain in layer two. Um, so the pre-image existence, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of predicate is like the simplest sort of rudimentary example of what happens, right? So the the the, the game or proposition is as follows: there exists a hash in you know the set of bytes, such that is hash pre-image h and h not for some some fixed h not uh, is known. Okay. So this game and the, the, has a different game tree depending on whether or not. H, uh, the, the, the particular, you know, like little h, is known and it's in the public information or is not, right? So this is the game, we'll just put the game up there. So if we're in world W, in which h dot is in IPUB, then this game is true, this game is true, right? Because the, the prover says there exists h, right? So the prover says this thing, then the opponent says no, for all h, not is hash preimage. But because h not is in the public information, P may choose it. It's in the computable subset, so it may be played. And so now we're left with P, not not is hash pre image, which reduces to not is hash pre image, which reduces to is hash pre image. And this is true, right? So it's one by P. So in a world in which H not is in the public domain, then this proposition is interpreted as true, because this is a winning strategy for that proposition, for the prover. However, if instead H0 is secret, right, it's secret to the opponent, then this will not be true. Because this step, which we previously had, is, n is, not, com is not computable, therefore it's not uh, possible. Right? Now, it may be allowed as wrong, but it's not possible. Because H0 is not, in P's, uh, is not in the public set of information, so it cannot be played. And, and no matter what the actual world is, right, so maybe the rest of the elements in the set, um, we might play some h prime or some h prime prime, but no matter what happens there, those are going to be false because at the end of the day, only h, uh, only this h not, which is secret and therefore not playable, is going to be the thing that gets us to a true statement at the bottom, a true leaf, a true game outcome. Okay, and so notably, what this means is that if we start out in this in this world in which h not is secret to O, then this proposition is uh, false. But if desired. By the, by the opponent, O may reveal that preimage. And in doing so, it would change the world. The world would no longer have H.I. My secret. It would we'd go back to this one, and it would now be true. Uh, so we've changed the truth. So we start in a world where the game, where the thing is false, and we ended a thing in which the thing is true, right? And because we can do that off-chain, and because we can enforce these games on-chain, this is how we get the scalability of layer two solutions. Wouldn't it be sort of cleaner and easier to think about if you just said P knows H such that? Sure, that might that might be cleaner. Yeah, I, I, it absolutely might. It absolutely might. Yeah. So this is a very simple thing that I've thrown together because the point I want to get across is these games are what happened on the main on the main chain in the, the layer twos, and someone's going to be able to do this very rigorously and effectively. Yes. So you're referencing local public information with the example of revealing a pre-image. It doesn't make the, st the statement necessarily true for all participants, just the party that actually was revealed to. Absolutely right. And that's why so far I've defined these semantics as between two imaginary players and proven opponent. Right. But you're absolutely right. What we need to do to like hit this with the universal composability, like you know, e you know, epic, like formal proof, you know, for all layer two model is we need to have that. We need to have a, a, a you know a, a, a distributed system of like many, many, many people. Public shared information. What what has been publicly shared to anyone, what has been publicly shared to only some people, and what has not been publicly shared, aka is private. Right? So absolutely this is what we need. And if you think you know it or know a good way to do it or know someone who knows a good way to do it, come find me. Yes. What is it useful for? So, 
So as we have uh, exactly one minute to go, what is it useful for? Well, here is a state channel. So the thing that we've been doing all along, which we've been calling state channels, and we've thought of as a unique thing, is actually simply this expression, OK? Um, so this is a pre-image reveal state channel. So we imagine that there's a set of hashes, which are all secret to the uh, opponent in the beginning. And as we progress through worlds, we selectively reveal each hash. And by associating a game of the form channel s to a payout of the form s, so that we pay, say, s coins out to someone, we can actually associate money with this game and by selectively revealing these three images, we selectively pay a one coin denomination to the player. So that's a state channel, okay? Uh, we can also do sort of more Ethereum style J channels. So here's our multi sig that we hit before. There's our multi sig. Um, and, and, and the game for an Ethereum style channel is I claim for this state, there exists a multi sig. Uh, and for there does not exist a higher state such that there is a multi sig and the state is indeed higher with the higher nonce, right? So there's that. Here's optimistic rollup. You know, Unipig.exchange, we just released a demo of this. This is a rollup chain. The computability model here for rollups are really nice because the Ethereum main chain always makes data available. So the computability model is much easier for any information that's on the main chain because it's always known, it can't be hidden. This is a very great property and makes for a very, very, very simple, graceful, elegant, distress, elegant, elegant thing, which gives us a nice layer to protocol. Lastly, Plasma, which is a god awfully complicated expression in some ways, this is the simplest plasma cache construction I can come up with, but I can tell you that this indeed works. Um, and so we've got a paper that talks more about how to associate money with this, blah, blah, blah. We've got to go. Thank you guys very much.